Hey guys, this is Trini and you're watching Python tutorial videos on my YouTube channel Python for Microscopists. In today's tutorial, let's work on a real-life application, which is grain size analysis. And as the name suggests, this is nothing but uh, loading a, uh, an image that has uh, a whole bunch of grains and uh, getting some statistics out of it. What does the grain size distribution look like? If you're a material scientist or geologist, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you are a uh, life scientist, think of this as uh, taking an image with a whole bunch of cells and trying to understand the size distribution of these cells. So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. And the image I'm going to use today is uh, pretty much this image. And I Google searched online for, uh, you know, grains or a microscope and grain or microstructure of a grain. And I found the one that I think is, uh, I mean, best demonstrates uh, our purpose here. So this appears to be an optical microscope image and it is an RGB image. So let's convert that to grayscale to begin with. But if you work on a scanning electron microscope, then you probably have uh, your microstructure pretty much looks pretty much the same, you know, from your sample, uh, except the scale may be different. Uh, and when I mention about scale, it's also important for us to define the scale in this case, right? If you ask me what is the average grain size of grains here, if I say, yeah, it is 200 pixels, what does that mean? What does that mean? But if I say the average grain size is 0.85 microns, that does mean something to you, right? So that's why we should also keep track of the pixel size when you work with uh, microscope images. So let's uh, jump in. And uh, one other thing I should mention is you should excuse me when I keep turning this side and then looking at uh, my notes here because this is a going to be a relatively long exercise. So I just want to make sure I hit the right topics and I want to make sure that I am not skipping some of the key information. For example, the structure parameter. Don't worry about it yet but I really would like to talk at least for five seconds about it. So I'll keep looking uh, uh, on this screen, but uh, hopefully it shouldn't bother you. And I hope you're focusing more on the code that I'm typing anyway. So uh, let's go ahead and go through these steps. Step one is reading image and defining the pixel size. And I broken the, I always like to break down any scenario into various steps so I know I can focus on certain things and that's exactly why I divided this here. Step one is obviously we need to read the image. Step two is clean up the image if needed. Step three is also clean up like eroding, dilation and some of those. Step four is we need to label the grains once we identify them and then measure it and then output the results to CSV file. So now we can break down things you know accordingly. Step zero, you probably know, always import CV2, import NumPy as NP, and import, by the way, please excuse me looking down because I have never mastered, 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 I've never mastered the art of uh, uh, typing by not looking uh, at the keyboard. So just uh, again, one other uh, <laughs> thing, little thing that you need to know about me. So. From matplotlib import pyplot as plt. Uh, what else do we need to import? I know I need nd image. So from sk image import nd image. And uh, uh, also from sk, uh, no, this one is from scipy, sorry. From scipy import nd image and from sk scikit image. I want to import IO, I want to import color because I want to show, uh, I want to display images uh, in color so we can, I mean, uh, so we can assign different colors to the grains, yeah? And what else? I want to import measure because eventually we would like to measure, uh, do some measurements. So uh, this one says there is an error, invalid syntax. Uh, what did I do? Uh, yeah, so that makes sense from matplotlib. Okay, so that's our step zero. Now let's do our step number one, which is uh, load our image. And we know how to do that. Image equals to cv 2im read. And our image is in images slash, and what is it called? Grains2 dot JPEG. And we may as well read this, uh, I mean, let's read this as a gray level image and not as a uh, color image. 
uh, color image would be a number one over there. So once we read our image, I'm also going to dis define uh, pixels to microns, a parameter, and I'm just going to call this, um, let's do 0.5. So what that means is, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, this is nothing but one pixel equals to 0.5 micrometers or uh, 500 nanometers. Yeah, that's exactly. So eventually when we do our measurements, I just want to multiply every pixel by 500. That's pretty much it, or 0.5. So that's why I'm defining it right now. So let's just go ahead and uh, continue. Now, uh, if your image actually has a scale bar, uh, this image doesn't have a scale bar down here, but most microscope images, I hate that. Uh, it's important to know the micron, you know, what the pixel size is, but embedding a scale bar other than for publishing purposes, I don't see a real reason. Anyway, if you're working with images that has scale bar, you obviously need to crop your image and you probably know how to do that, uh, uh, cropping an image. Uh, let me go ahead and show that. Cropped image equals to, we are just going to slice our data set and uh, which data set? Image array. And uh, if you're going to go this way, uh, you know, crop some of the pixels uh, uh, then you just do zero to whatever, 300, let's say. You just want to take the first 300 uh, from the top and then all of the pixels, you know, in, in uh, the X direction, in the width direction. So from height, zero to 300, and from width, it's every pixel over there. Luckily, we don't have to do that for the image that uh, we are working with. So let's continue uh, to our uh, step number two. So now that we have a pixel, now let's do denoising, but this image looks very clean, so let's not worry about denoising. If there is a, a lot of noise, you will see that when you threshold it, which, which is when we can come back and then do some denoising, okay? Let's skip the denoising there, and uh, what is the next step here? Uh, uh, and by the way, uh, again, I'm looking at my notes. By the way, if you do end up doing denoising, like I mentioned this multiple times in my previous tutorials, uh, the best uh, ones would be a median filter uh, or better yet, for microscope images, a non-local means filter is the best choice uh, for denoising. So that's, uh, uh, so once you have that, then we are all set, you know. So the next step is step two, denoising if required and threshold image to separate grains from boundaries. So let's go ahead and do thresholding. And we looked at thresholding in our previous tutorials again. Step one, step one. Uh, 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 step one as part of thresholding is to actually looking at the histogram itself. So PLT dot histogram, yeah? So look at the histogram and the histogram here is of our image and our image is a 2D array. To do histogram, you, you need 1D array. So I'm gonna flatten this, okay? Image dot flat, all it does is just takes this 2D and then just flattens it to 1D uh, array. And then let's uh, plot this to 100 bins and then let's do our range equals to this is an 8-bit image so 0 to 255 so I just want to look at the entire range okay so now when I run this we should see a uh, histogram there and that looks very nice our image is 8-bit uh, and that histogram a bunch of pixels around 220 ish or so 210 and I see like as a valley right around 150 to 160 uh, so we can do two things, one of two things. We can do manual thresholding or we can do some sort of an automatic thresholding using OTSU. And I've covered this in the previous, uh, 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 you know, tutorial anyway. So let's go ahead and do uh, return. And, and, and by the way, I'm unwrapping again. Uh, once I apply this CV2 dot threshold, I'm going to get two uh, things out. One is the thresholded value and also the image itself or the array itself uh, after thresholding. So we'll see that in a second. So the way you do that is cv2.thresh and which image are we going to threshold or img, that's what we're going to threshold and uh, starting at zero pixel value. And once it's thresholded, uh, uh, assign a value of 255 to all the thresholded pixels and using what algorithm do you want uh, it to threshold? So I'm going to use dhresh uh, uh, -E underscore binary threshold method plus cv, sorry, uh, lowercase cv2 dot dhresh -E underscore 
Otsu, O-T-S-U, okay? So this is, uh, and again, let's run the code to make sure everything is okay. So obviously something is not okay here. So what did I do? Uh, CV2 has no attribute threshold. Oh, sorry, this should be threshold. So this is why it's very important to run the code uh, after almost after every line. So it runs okay this time. And now you see that RET value, which is the uh, Otsu suggested or Otsu picked threshold value for this image is 157. So we were okay with our guess between 150 to 160. So this is 157. And, and if you look at the threshold, it's also a 8-bit image. Uh, it's not a binary image. It's an 8-bit image with values of uh, 255 because we said all the thresholded pixels should have 255. So all the pixels corresponding to our grain will have a value of 255. All the pixels corresponding to grain boundary will have a value of zero. So this is only a thresholded image, and this is not a uh, this is not a uh, uh, binary image. Okay, so we need to convert this thresholded image into a uh, binary image. But before moving on, you can actually look at this uh, uh, image of this uh, thresholded image. So one way you know that cv2 dot show uh, Actually, I need to give a title and then the source and do not forget to do wait key. This is how long does the system wait before the window closes. If I put zero, that means I'm gonna close it manually. If you don't put this, it may crash, you know? So uh, you, the ker kernel restarts and hell will unleash. So let's go ahead and run this and here is my thresholded image. That looks great actually, except uh, a few of these areas uh, I see some missing some missing pixels. So I wonder if we can close some of these areas by eroding uh, and dilating. When I erode, my grains will shrink by one pixel. And when I dilate them back, they go back up by pixel. And in this process, when I shrink, I'm hoping that some of these dark areas, the, the grain boundaries would connect and then give us a slightly better definition of these grains. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, clean the image up. And I guess we are getting into step three now. Step number three, clean up the image if needed. Well, it shouldn't say clean up. This is basically, uh, well, maybe clean up is the right term. So before, uh, 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 for, I mean, as part of our erode and dilate operations, it needs a kernel size. So let me go ahead and define kernel. Again, I have done this exercise in my previous tutorial, so I'm going a bit fast right now. So uh, I'm going to create uh, uh, np.ones. You know, this is my uh, kernel of 3 by 3 and of type, uh, let's uh, np.uint8. Yeah. So this is my kernel. And now I can just say my eroded image equals to cv2.erode. Okay, and which image are we eroding? Not the original image, but the thresholded image, yeah? And then the other parameter is kernel, and how many times? Iterations equal to one. So now let's look at our uh, eroded, actually let's leave the original image as is, and then add another line for eroded image so we can compare both. Eroded image equals to E-R-O-D-E-D. -D. Let's run this. So there you go. So my original image eroded image. All I did is, you know, pixels down. I could have started with dilate to uh, actually fill some of these. There is operation called hole fill. There are a few things that you can try. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to experiment with that right now. But I eroded this. Now let's go ahead and dilate it. Uh, so we are not changing anything here. So I mean, so we go back. With, without changing the image by a lot. So now I want to dilate this and the operation is cv2.dilate and we are going to dilate the eroded image. So my input image is eroded. So let's actually look at dilated image now, okay? Dilated, so when I run this, we should see uh, on the left-hand side is the actual threshold image. On the right-hand side, this is eroded once and dilated. 
some areas may be increased. Like if you look at this region, I'm not really happy that I'm changing uh, uh, information in this region. So I'm going to keep it as is for now. Let's see, let's do our analysis and we can actually uh, use our threshold image as input to our next step rather than dilate it. So it doesn't hurt to do this exercise anyway. So now that we have done uh, uh, some erosion and dilation, so let's move on to the next step, which is, uh, what is my next step? Uh, clean up the image is done, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, so we need to convert this into a, a binary image because the thresholded image is nothing but a 8-bit integer with all values of 255 and uh, zeros. It's a binary image, 255 and zeros, but the system doesn't know that it's a binary image. The system knows that it is an 8-bit integer image. So let's convert this thresholded image into a binary. So I'm going to call this my mask equals to, and you probably know how to do this. Yeah. So I'm going to take my dilated image and if equals equals to 255. So what this does is uh, at every uh, uh, pixel location, if or every uh, uh, point in this array, if the value is equals to 255, then the mask would be uh, uh, at that position would be true, right? You know this logical operation. Anytime you do greater than, less than, or double equals, this is comparing something with something else, right? So we are saying that in dilated, if the value is equal to 255, then it would return a true. If it's not 255, meaning if it is zero, it returns a false. So when we run this again, uh, we should now see mask a boolean of the same array size as our input image where every value is true or false, okay? So this is the binary image that we have actually uh, generated and io.im show, let's go ahead and look at our mask. So when I run this, you should see the mask uh, right there, okay? And why did I use io.im show and not cv2? For whatever reason, when I tried this uh, during my practice run, uh, CV2, in fact, I had to re-record this video until this point because CV2.imshow uh, is not showing the Boolean image and I didn't want to dig into why, uh, but this actually worked, so I'm gonna use this. So, uh, now, by the way, if uh, at this point, we, I mean, let's go ahead and zoom in and see, uh, and see how it looks like. Uh, let's do, our image size is 354 by 410, so if we go to 250 by 250 or two, let's just do 280. Yeah, 250 by 280 in uh, X and then 250 by 280. So let's just, this is a way of zooming in. So we only see that small box and you can see this is my grain boundary and this is my grain here, okay? So we are good with that. So we are done with our mask and what is our next uh, step? Uh, so we created the mask, so we're done with step three. Step four is label the grains in the masked image. So now we need to label the grains, uh, step four, right? So uh, how do we label the grains? Uh, let me look at my notes so I do not, uh, so I don't forget talking about uh, uh, this one thing called structure. Uh, before explaining that, let me go ahead and, and, and just write this, uh, write this uh, line down so, uh, so you know exactly what I mean. Uh, one, 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 and uh, da, 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 one, 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 and uh, one, one, one. So I'm defining this as my structure factor, which I'm going to explain in a second. And then the label mask in in ND image, the reason why I imported ND image here is in ND image, there is a function called label, which actually labels each of these uh, uh, unconnected grains. If these grains are connected even by a single pixel, meaning uh, then that's one object altogether. So all this label does is it actually goes through this and uh, it, uh, it, it uh, uh, figures out, uh, well, it actually assigns a label to all unconnected objects. Now, this S is a way of defining what that connection is, whether they are connected or unconnected, okay? So that's pretty much it. So label mask and number of labels. These are the values that it's going to return. The ND image dot label is going to return. So ND image dot label is going to return label underscore mask 
and num labels okay so so far fine and on what image are we going to apply obviously we need a mask and then the structure equals to s okay and our s is one 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 the reason why we have to define this if you do not define you can just run mask then it's going to use again let me look at the uh, uh, the numbers zero one zero 111 and 010 instead of all 111s. Why does it matter? Well, uh, they call this like uh, eight connectivity. This is eight connectivity. You can look up the documentation and the other one is four connectivity. What that basically means is uh, the diagonal di di diagonal pixels will be included as part of the structure. Okay, when you do this, uh, all of this. And what does structure basically mean? It specifies, it specifies when to consider a pixel to be connected to another nearby pixel, okay? So in a way, when we are uh, labeling these images, it's actually using the structure factor to figure out whether an object is an independent object or whether it is connected to something else, so that object would be a bigger object. That's pretty much it, okay? And the reason why I'm using 111, all these ones is, this is exactly what image J uses, and image J is this imaging uh, desktop program that microscopists use for image processing. So just to make sure I'm uh, uh, keeping the convention the same with image J, I'm just using all ones. That's pretty much it. Anyway, that's my notes on this, uh, and uh, uh, I I don't want to fail about talking talking this uh, about this. So anyway, so now let's go ahead and run this to make sure everything is working fine. So that seems to be fine. And our label mask, as you can see, is a 32-bit integer with values going from one, I also see some 16s there, and our number of labels, it says the, uh, the, the value here is 296. So that kind of tells me it found 296 grains in this image, okay? So it's now uh, uh, all of these objects are labeled. So the next step is, uh, in, fa in fact, I'm thinking whether we should go to next step. Let's actually uh, look at this image by adding some color because, uh, 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 I mean, I, I, I imported this color for a reason. So let's go ahead and uh, look at this image. So let's assign this to a uh, parameter called, uh, I mean, to, to a variable image two, and it's color dot. Let's just, uh, there is a function called label two RGB. Okay, so it basically assigns random colors in red, green, and blue, uh, and it out to the label. It's self-explanatory from the name, right? So I'm in label to RGB, and then let's do label, which is our label underscore mask, right? That's our label, and then the other one is uh, colors none BG color background color. I don't know our background label equal to let's just say uh, zero okay it says background label zero minus one you can experiment with a few of these we'll see uh, so labeled uh, uh, oh I just I can change it here or here so that's okay labeled mask and number of labels let's go ahead and plot this and uh, we should have seen something Image to color dot label. Oh, never mind. I mean, I, I, I mean, I generated this, but I'm we're not seeing it. So let's just do cv two dot m show, and this would be a uh, colored labels. Let's say, okay, and then image two, cv two dot weight key zero. Okay, now we should see something. There you go image is on my other screen so let me go ahead and pull it here that's a nice pretty image we could have I'm not sure if these are randomly assigned colors or if these are uh, connected pixels so it's uh, it's it's thinking that this is to me it sounds like it think it thinks that all of this is the same uh, so we could have actually done some more image processing to get this by the way I'm a bit curious instead of dilated uh, uh, right here what happens if we use uh, uh, what happens if we use thresholded yeah I'm just getting curious uh, now so if we use thresholded then 
yeah, you see a big chunk of green right there, continuous greens right here. And, uh, uh, and by actually doing this erode and dilate, let's do dilated now. By doing this erode and dilate, uh, we are breaking down some of these regions, maybe or maybe not. But anyway, so looks like this helped uh, the image processing. We could have done better. So again, please do it at your own time. So now that we have our uh, image, what is the next step? Uh, uh, so the next step is, uh, t -t 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 uh, well, we are, sorry, I, could, I can easily look here. So label grains in the matched image, we're done with that. Step five is measure the properties of each grain. So we finally are here. So let's measure the properties. So step number five, if I can type correctly, okay. Step number five is uh, measuring. How do we do this? And again, uh, I uh, there is a region prop function in scikit image module. You can look at the uh, uh, documentation and the uh, region props, uh, all it does is uh, uh, it extracts the properties of each regions if the image is labeled. So it takes in a labeled image and just extracts a whole bunch of region properties, including uh, uh, area and particle grain, di uh, I mean diameters and a whole bunch of stuff. It's literally one line. So let's assign that to uh, something called, uh, let's, shall we call it grains? Let's call this clusters. Yeah, equals to, it is in measure. Okay, remember we imported measure uh, before and, uh, uh, and it's called region props right there. So measure dot region props, and by the way, measure is part of our scikit image. Okay, so measure dot region props, and uh, what do we do? Uh, I'm actually thinking uh, labeled image, which is our uh, labeled mask, and what else do we need? Uh, uh, intensity image equals to oh. So this intensity image is nothing but our original image. So if we actually include the original image, it also calculates uh, the intensity values. Like within that grain, if you want to know what the maximum intensity is or mean, uh, mean intensity is or minimum intensity, that's when uh, it's, it's very useful. I'm gonna do that anyway. Uh, why not, I mean, why miss any information? So that's it. Clusters and let's see if the implementation worked okay. Yeah, no issues there. So uh, in fact, if you look at clusters, it's an object where you can see it's uh, uh, returning, like, the size is 296 because it detected 296 grains and it's got a bunch of region properties. And how do we extract this region properties? That's the next, uh, that's the next part. So there are various region properties like area, equivalent diameter, and a whole bunch of other things uh, that, you can, uh, uh, that you can look at. In fact, uh, I actually uh, uh, copied my uh, property list just to, I mean, let me put the, just a second, let me pull this over here. So these are some of these properties, area, equivalent di diameter, orientation, ma major axis length, minor axis length. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, copy that. And before that, I think uh, maybe we should, we, we should look uh, at, uh, uh, some of these measurements. So, so let's look at perimeter, for example, okay? So print within our clusters, okay? And not all the clusters, uh, uh, all the grains, let's just look at grain number zero, okay? The first grain, which per uh, parameter? Let's actually print out the value of the perimeter for that one. So if I just run this, so the perimeter of the first one is 118 point whatever that, that, uh, that value, okay? So that's the perimeter it calculated for that uh, uh, image. And you can actually look at uh, 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 a whole bunch of other values. So let me copy and paste from my other screen here. So uh, uh, in fact, I did write a uh, for a loop right there. I don't wanna waste time. So I just prepared a little bit before doing this. So for properties in clusters, okay, which is nothing but this, print, label, area, these are placeholders from one of my previous tutorials, you, you can see this, and the format is prop.label, meaning this prop.label that goes in here, and prop.area that goes in here. So I'm just looping through 
to print this. And when I print this, you should be able to see that it's actually printing label 275, area is 229. Label 276, area is 37. You can dump this into uh, an Excel sheet or into a note, uh, notepad, uh, I mean, into a text file if you want. So this is one way of extracting. So this calculates the region props anyway. Now we are figuring out what are the best ways of actually uh, uh, extracting the result. The best way uh, is to dump it into an Excel file. So now let's look at our step number uh, six. I believe that's output results into CSV file. Yeah. So for that, let me take my prop list that I just uh, put it in my, I mean, I just copied in my notepad because I don't want to type this again here. So these are the properties I want to dump, okay? I called it the properties list. Uh, so equivalent diameter orientation. So uh, yeah, I, I took some notes while I was testing, verify if it works, angle between orientation. So it was working, so I just can delete that, okay? So these are the properties list I want to extract from region props and do the next step, which is dump it into a CSV file. If you watched my tutorial just before this one, I talked about how to create, how to write and read, you know, uh, from and to uh, CSV files. So here I'm going to just define my output file, okay, equals to, if you remember, dealing with CSV files, I'm going to open a CSV file. And uh, what do we call it? Let's just say image measurements dot csv okay i'm going to open it in the right mode w if i put t right next to it right text mode but by default if i don't put anything it is text so i created this i opened it so let's start writing uh, to it output underscore file okay dot write this is how we write to this file once it's open what do I want to write? So uh, let's start with a comma because what I'm trying to put here is the uh, is the header. So the first row, I want it to be area, equivalent diameter, orientation, and so on. So a header, and then I want to put all the, uh, dump all the numbers. Uh, I'm leaving the first, uh, 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 by putting a comma, I'm re leaving the first uh, cell open basically that's pretty much it excuse me and I'm doing this because I've done a couple of things before and I thought this is the best way to uh, uh, deal with this so I'm not experimenting during this video I've done that already that's why I'm I'm just doing uh, uh, in fact let's go ahead and copy and paste this so I don't type anything wrong way so there you go so this is what I just did. So what it's going to do is, this is nothing but a uh, comma. It's going to add this uh, prop list, which is nothing but uh, you know each one of these. And then it creates a new line after it's done. Okay, that's all it's doing. Okay. And we leave the, uh, we, leave, we left the first cell blank to leave room for the header. Okay. So, uh, uh, meaning the column names. Now, let's, uh, for clusters, yeah, I'm going to define our cluster props. Let's say for cluster properties in clusters, okay? So now I'm using the for loop to go through every one of these entry in the clusters, okay? So for cluster props in clusters, now what do we want to do, okay? Output underscore file, right? So underscore file dot write so i'm writing uh let's just uh, write a string in fact let me go back to my text and see instead of me inventing this uh do i have it on my text file here uh so let's actually bring this and let me not ex again i am i have done this before so i'm just going copying and pasting and this is very self-explanatory if you look at this so now let me go ahead and explain this. Output cluster properties to the Excel file, obviously, dot write, yeah? And I'm uh, 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 writing labels as a string. And then uh, for I prop in enumerate prop list, where enumerate, remember again, one of my previous tutorials, prop list, meaning it's unwrapping, it's actually going through like uh, area, equivalent diameter, orientation, 
if the prop equals to area, okay, if it is equals to area, again, you don't need all of this. I could have just, I could have just uh, uh, gone through each of this and printed everything into an Excel sheet. The reason I chose to do this is I want to convert my pixels into microns or square microns. That's exactly why I actually created this. So I'm going through each of these property in the property list. And I'm saying that if my property is area, then uh, what do you want to print? I want to print the cluster prop, yeah, the value multiplied by the square of my pixels. Again, area is two dimensional, right? So we need to multiply by the square. So convert the pixel to square microns rather than just pixels. That's exactly what I'm doing here. Else if, if it's not area, then look at the orientation because I'm also printing, I've added orientation literally five minutes before uh, I, I am recording this video uh, and then realized, okay, if it is orientation, it's printing the orientation in radians. So we need to convert uh, it to degrees so we can uh, understand it a bit better. So I am multiplying this by 57.2958, so which is converting your degrees into radians, okay? Else if uh, intensity, again, if it is intensity values, they go from zero to 255. I don't want to multiply pixel value to that. So else if it is intensity, if the intensity is, uh, uh, basically what the statement says is, if it uh, 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 has no intensity in its name, meaning if it is uh, uh, equivalent diameter or if it is perimeter, then multiply it by pixels to microns, yeah, which is nothing but 0.5 microns in our example. Else, meaning what else is left over? minimum intensity, mean, and max intensity, yeah? Then just print the value as is. Don't multiply it with anything, okay? Please digest this part. This is, again, not pretty complicated. All I'm doing is, uh, in fact, I you don't need any of this if you just want to print everything as pixels and be fine with it, okay? Uh, or just the intensity. But because I'm mixing some of these, I just wanted to show you how to convert that into real life uh, uh, measurements, you know, that you can relate to rather than just pixels. So that's it. And then it's actually, uh, because we are uh, to, uh, uh, created a variable called to print, obviously it's uh, going to print right there as part of your output file dot write, okay? And then creates a new file. So that's pretty much it actually. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And there you go. So hopefully in my folder here, I should see a file that's called image measurements written at, yeah, right now, which is 1020 AM Pacific Standard Time. And it's opening the Excel sheet. And in a second, I'll, okay, it opened it on this other screen. So let me pull it right there okay so there you go area equivalent diameter orientation major axis all of these and then your area here and orientation in degrees right there and uh, uh, and your major axis minor axis perimeter your minimum intensity in within that grain maximum intensity within that grain and the mean intensity so this is this is the entire statistics and now that it is in excel you can do whatever you want, you know, convert that into a table, for example, you know, and then go ahead and do uh, plotting, you know, uh, do your pivot tables and uh, do a whole bunch of stuff that Excel lets you do. Although it's very nice if you know how to use pandas, which is uh, how Python handles these type of data structures. They call it data frames. It creates a data frame and then it makes it easy for you to do uh, uh, like any statistical analysis or machine learning type of analysis. If you want to see what is the relationship between uh, the diameter and uh, major axis and, uh, you know, and uh, I don't know, it's orientation, if there is a relationship, uh, sometimes it's very uh, easy to use machine learning to get in better insights rather than just uh, plain statistical based analysis. I'm not a very good expert at deep learning and all of that, but I know a little bit of machine learning, which I hope uh, I can include as part of one of my upcoming videos. So until then, 
I hope you learned something and uh, uh, I hope you found this to be useful. And for you life scientists, I'll see if I can repeat something similar using an image that has uh, a whole bunch of cells so you can relate it better. But again, this is image processing, the type of image. Uh, it's it's com it should be pretty agnostic. You know, it's completely uh, ones and zeros or 255s and zeros. It has nothing to do with your image, but I I do understand that you relate well if it is a uh, uh, if it is uh, a, an image that you can well relate to. So, thank you very much for your attention. If you like this video, uh, please like it. You know uh, uh, below, and if you like these uh, videos that I'm creating, please subscribe to my channel. It definitely encourages me to create more content. And uh, creating these videos obviously takes time. And uh, I do a lot of research before uh, uh, doing these videos and, and, and cheat a lot by getting information from various sources, all to make sure the content is put in such a way that a typical microscopist who is not a programmer can digest it in an easy way. Okay, so please subscribe to my channel and let's uh, cover a different topic in the next tutorial. And until then, enjoy your life and thank you very, very much.